Hi everybody, welcome to A Case of the Jills. So I already talked about this on Instagram, but I just wanted to go ahead and thank you again for the intelligent and amazingly thoughtful questions that you asked on Instagram stories. Sometimes I'm not really sure where people's you know, mood is. So I will sometimes ask, you know, what are you guys thinking about? Okay, so real talk. I get a lot of questions from people who don't know me and sometimes they ask me things like, you know, how long did it take you to get your period back and what do I have to eat and how much should I be running and these kinds of things that uh, you, you guys know me by now. I don't really like to answer because they're kind of beside the point and also we've covered that stuff ad nauseum on here, let's be real. But this time when you guys asked me questions, they were so thoughtful and they were so not the norm and they were just from a population of people that you can tell is really really interested in learning some cool stuff. Unfortunately, there were so many good questions that I'm not gonna be able to answer all of them today, but I am gonna do a second video that is gonna come out next week that is gonna answer some of the other great questions that you asked. So if your question doesn't get answered today, don't despair, you'll see me again next week. Okay, in order to start this off, somebody asked me on Instagram actually just this morning, what is the relationship between HA or Red S and anxiety? Talking about HA, and by the way, I'm going to use HA just because it's quicker than saying HA and or Red S. It is almost impossible to talk about HA without talking about anxiety. And I'm really glad this person asked the question because I'm kind of inundated in the research all day long and I know that HA and anxiety are really like very closely related for so many reasons, but you're right that you might not see this, especially when you're at the beginning stages of recovery or when you are kind of still in that mode of not really understanding what it means to recover or all the things we're gonna talk about. So I'm glad for the reminder. HA is the result of over exercise and under eating, typically speaking. Those are maybe the mechanical manifestations of what's going on. It's important that we understand though that those behaviors are attractive for a person looking to subvert a certain type of emotional state. What we're saying is, is that people, typically people who are anxious, are using those behaviors really as a coping mechanism for that anxiety. Sometimes when I'm talking about my research, it's difficult for people to understand the link between overexercise and coping mechanism. However, people may have an easier time understanding how we compensate for uncomfortable emotions by using other things, let's say like alcohol or drugs or sex or shopping or gambling. Those are other behaviors that we may use, often to the point of abuse, to compensate for certain things that we might be feeling. So the same is true of running or any other type of exercise that you're doing too much of to the point where you begin to affect your health. In my opinion, everyone who feels anxiety offsets that anxiety by using different behaviors. For some people, like I said, it could be any of the ones I mentioned before, but really it's the same thing. We're compensating for uncomfortable feelings with a behavior. Therefore, it's not really HA that causes anxiety, although under eating is going to cause a certain amount of anxiety because of what we know about what starvation does to the brain, and we're gonna talk more about that later. But the things that lead you into HA are typically a compensation for that anxious behavior, and so they kind of go together. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Of course, we have to also talk about the fact that when you have HA, you're gonna have a certain amount of anxiety about not getting a period. We would expect that. You're gonna have anxiety about what you're eating, what you're doing for training, how much you should be doing for training, how much you should be eating. And it becomes an increased amount of pressure too when we add on potentially issues of fertility concerns. And then on and on in advanced stages of HA, when we're talking about things like bone density loss, et cetera, et cetera, all those complications that do come around, of course, those things are gonna cause anxiety. So you've got anxiety leading you into HA and anxiety greeting you all the way through the process of HA. I've talked about anxiety and HA in other videos, so I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole of like personality types, but there are some things we can say about people's personality types, typically like a perfectionistic type A personality, neurotic personality, and how that relates to how they compensate and what they use to compensate for those uncomfortable emotions 
blah 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 Jill we've talked about it before but I can go over that again if anyone wants me to just leave a comment below so someone asked the question is it normal to relapse into negative symptoms like insomnia months into recovery my first question to this person has to be like what have you changed are you maybe restricting a little more now that you've recovered are you eating less have you amped up your training the answer is no this is not normal since it should not be happening but the answer is also yes in the sense that it is very common that this happens when people kind of either ease back on the new good habits that they have established or have returned to some of the bad ones. The other option for this is that if this person is perhaps in the luteal phase of their menstrual cycle, Insomnia can be common. That is something that can happen. However, if you are experiencing that insomnia along with hot flashes, waking up hungry, and maybe some other things that are leading us to believe that you are under fueling again, that's where we have to try to understand what went wrong. And a lot of times the reason why this is very troubling is because it suggests to me that the person went about fixing the mechanical issues that would lead to HA. So the person probably started eating more, maybe more carbohydrates, the person was training less, taking more rest days, et cetera. But if the symptoms are coming back and the person has fallen back into bad habits, that makes me think that the underlying reasons why this person is using these behaviors to compensate for something, or maybe there's an insecurity there, or something is going on that the person really has not addressed. Another issue with this is that when we return to training or when we think we want to do things like reduce our caloric intake, we have to remember the fact that once you lose your period once, you are that much more susceptible to losing it again. In effect, your ceiling is lower. That means that things that may not have caused you to lose your period in the past will potentially cause you to lose it now because your body is that much more vulnerable. I hope that answers that question. Here is an unbelievable question. This person asks, is it normal to be unsure if you want your period back? Oh, this is the best. This is such a great question. Do you know why? Because this is a question that is so brave. It is something that so many people think about, but nobody wants to say. And you know what? Like, no shame. This is so great that this person, first of all, just was brave enough to say it, but trusted me with the answer. Uh, I'm just blown away by this. So thank you for this question. The answer, by the way, is yes. It is absolutely normal to kind of be on the fence about whether or not you want to go through recovery from HA. For this population, that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean turning away from a sport that you've been doing for a really long time or taking a long break from it. It can mean lifestyle changes, like big ones that might take you away from people you've been training with, your team, friends, all kinds of stuff. It can mean big scary changes in your diet. It can mean facing some things that you have not wanted to face for a really long time. It can also mean a loss of identity because of all of the stuff I just mentioned. So yeah, like this doesn't sound like a Disney holiday to me. It's, it's hard. If it's giving you pause, if it's making you say to yourself like, man, do I really want to do this? Let me help you decide. Every month that you don't get a period, puts you at increased risk for irreversible damage. First of all, osteoporosis. If you haven't had a DEXA scan and you've been without a period for a while, you could already be in a stage of osteopenia, which is the initial stage of osteoporosis, or you could have full-fledged osteoporosis. Sometimes part of that osteoporosis is irreversible. And what's worse is that when you have weak bones, you leave yourself vulnerable to things like stress fractures. If that doesn't scare the crap out of you, you can also be at an increased risk for heart disease. When you don't make enough estrogen, your heart does not have certain protective measures. And by the way, yes, this can happen to young women just as much as it can happen to women uh, around and after the age of menopause. I have talked to women who have had heart conditions as a result of a being in a state of HA for too long. And by the way, yes, these were runners. so. It's possible. Worse than all of this, even, gosh, this, this is the trigger for me, cognitive decline. You are actually starving your brain. You are melting your brain. I mean, I can understand, honestly, when people maybe feel a little bit conflicted about their own fertility. I understand this, it's a very complex issue, but cognitive function, your brain, your ability to speak and think and have memory and talk and do work and feel emotions. I mean, if you don't value that, that's a very serious issue. Even if those physiological concerns don't bother you, 
If you don't want to recover from HA, what you're saying is that you don't value yourself. What you're saying is that running away from something is more important than facing it. Is there anything in your life that's so big that you would rather run away from it than face it? Risk all of those other health implications because the pain of that thing is so great. What are you telling yourself there? Are you telling yourself that you can't manage that pain? I don't, I don't believe that. I think, I think you can. Granted, you may not be able to do it alone and that's why there are qualified healthcare practitioners and therapists and wonderful people on this planet to help you navigate that. But I think you deserve better. And I think that you need to value yourself more. Like I said, it's fair to have these thoughts. There are many reasons why somebody might not want to get a period. Like I said, I mean, it could be that you're conflicted about your fertility. It could be that you're conflicted about your gender presentation. There are people for whom presenting as overly female feels injurious to their personal identity. You might not want to be forced into a role or forced into thinking that you want to have children or that you should be having children. You might think of it as like a way of conforming. And for some people, they just might not want to take care of themselves in that way. Whatever your reasons, validity notwithstanding, you will either have to deal with HA or you will have to deal with the scary consequences of it. One way or another, like I said, I think that, I think you deserve better. I hope that I've convinced you. Oh my gosh, here's another good one. Can HA be the reason for the inability to fall in love? Oh my gosh. <laughs> this one should be a book or a movie or something. This is just such a beautiful question. I love this so much. It's so, it's so complex. So let's, let's, let's take this from both sides. Let's take this from the scientific biology side and let's take it from the psychological side. No. There is nothing specifically about hypothalamic amenorrhea, the condition of that, that makes it difficult for you to be in love. You could have HA and be in love with someone. Um, it's definitely possible. However, the answer is yes, because so many aspects of HA mean physical and or psychological dysfunction. Don't be afraid of that word, but uncovering those things is uncovering why love is so elusive in this moment. Let's talk about the biology first. The reason, one of the reasons why you may not be able to feel certain emotions or why it may be more difficult for you to access them has to do with your body being in a state of famine. And in a state of famine or a state of starvation, we have something going on called hypogonadism. So this is the failure of your ovaries to function properly. That's when you have a decrease in sex hormones. You have a decrease in libido, of course, meaning even if you were in a relationship with someone, like sex is totally not gonna to be interesting to you. Also with HA, you're gonna have an increase in stress hormones, which is going to make you feel more anxious. You're gonna be more irritable and you may even be more paranoid. Also with this means a decrease in neurotransmitters. It will make it more difficult for you to regulate your emotions. You will feel more unable to cope with things. You will also have a tendency to isolate. You won't want to be social. You won't want to hang out with people. You will be more prone to obsessional thinking. So none of these things really make you want to go out and date. And if you're in a relationship already, they may make you feel really cold and isolated in yourself. When you're feeling that much anxiety and you feel that your emotions are out of control, I mean, let's face it, if you're in a relationship that is gonna spill over to the person that you're with, you may start having more arguments with the person that you're with, you may feel that they don't understand you, you may feel that you don't understand yourself. This is a really delicate and vulnerable kind of place to be. So let's continue to talk about some of those psychological aspects. If you have HA because you are an underfed athlete who spends all of her time thinking about training or going out and training, of course you're gonna not have time and really not have the wherewithal to think about dating, meeting people, or spending time with people. If you have HA because you are compensating, like we talked about before, for something kind of terrible in your life or some type of emotional upheaval, some type of underlying anxiety, maybe some trauma, you are not gonna be thinking about falling in love with someone. You are not gonna be thinking about that. You're gonna be thinking about survival, just kind of getting through the day. And because you need your physical activity in those moments, or you think you need your physical activity in those moments to get you through that, 
that's gonna be your focus, not the date or the social event. But in that sense, it's not really HA that is leading you to not be able to feel love, it's the thing that prompted you to overexercise that you ended up with HA. So for all these reasons, yes, HA can really take you away from loving relationships. The most important of which is the loving relationship with yourself. And this is where the Auntie Jill advice comes in. All of this stuff can be fixed by eating more. You need to fuel your brain because you fall in love with your brain, not your body. Despite what society wants you to think, you have to do this so that you can fall in love with yourself. When you establish that love with yourself, that's when a strong, loving, long-term relationship really has space to grow in your life. A love relationship is not going to fix you. You can't be in a relationship with someone who loves you into loving yourself doesn't really work that way. Your partner can't fix you, whether you've been with them for a long time or whether they're a new partner, like they can't fix you. You have to love yourself enough to eat more so that you can learn who this is, value all of this, know that you deserve it, go out there into the world with an open heart and a fed brain. Okay, next question is another interesting one. It is very dark out because I think it's gonna rain. Okay, hope you can still see me. The next question is, is frequent urination and stress incontinence HA related? Yes. Stress hormones will increase with HA. That is why you don't make enough female sex hormones to get a period. You have an enormous amount of circulating stress hormones in the system. We've talked about this before in previous videos. Chronic and long-term stress increases cortisol, which is gonna decrease antidiuretic hormone, and then it is going to make you pee. This gets more complex the longer the chronic stress goes on, but the answer there is yes. If you feel like you have to pee more when you have HA, yes, that is definitely happening. The person asked about stress incontinence, but stress incontinence is not psychological stress. Stress incontinence comes from anything that makes you like jump or bounce. It's that pressure stress that it's talking about, not psychological stress. That being said, there is some evidence to suggest that female runners may have a slight increase in chance of having stress incontinence because of the jostling motion, jostling motion of running. Of course, you're also drinking water the whole time and that can also be exacerbated by the fact that if you're drinking caffeine either before you run or some people drink caffeinated beverages while they run, so that would also make things worse. Do your Kegels, ladies. I just did one right now. But what I think you might wanna consider, or the person who wrote this question, is whether or not this is actually urge incontinence, and that is something that is related to anxiety. So urge incontinence is also known as overactive bladder. This is also related to anxiety as your nervous system activates and you have to pee. This is much more likely in the case of HA. By the way, not everybody, but I'm just saying this is a possibility. This is something that I've actually noticed in my own life. I kind of had this since I was a little kid. When I was a little kid, I was afraid to go down into the basement because that's what you do when you're a kid. You're afraid of dark basements. And every time I had to go down to the basement of my house, I would have to pee and I didn't understand why. I know that's kind of silly, but that's kind of the thing we're talking about. I still notice this in my life now when I'm having moments of kind of a lot of anxiety. When I go to sleep at night, I have to get up and pee two or three times before I actually fall asleep at night. There's just something in my head that tells me I have to pee, I have to pee. And there's always pee there, it's not that there's nothing, but it does get worse when I'm feeling more anxious, which is like all the time. I can't tell you how many times I talk to women with HA that tell me that they're peers. They tell me that all the time, I'm a peer. It does happen a lot. Anyway, like I said, consider that urge incontinence thing. Look it up. Okay, I had to turn some lights on because it's really dark in here now. Okay, last two questions are gonna be quick because this video is really gonna be long. Somebody asked me a question about getting a dog and if it does really help with HA recovery. I would ask her right now, but you can tell that she is quite busy at the moment. I actually made a whole video about Tulip, my beautiful greyhound, and her role in helping me recover from HA. And honestly, I encourage you to watch that video. I'm gonna leave the link either up here if I figure out how to do it or down below. You guys, what I don't know about YouTube functionality is a lot, if you haven't already guessed. <laughs> the video is really comprehensive. It explains the whole story and it explains just everything about it. So I would say just watch that video. But the answer is yes, 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 yes. She's the greatest thing on earth and pets are wonderful. Animals in general are wonderful for so many reasons. So please watch that video. The last question is actually oh, another great one. I love this. And the question is, what do I do on rest days? Girl, what do you not do on rest days is a better question. So I, I think that you guys know me by now. I've said this before, but I will make sure that we're clear. I am very much against the term 
active rest day. The only thing I think you should be active about on a rest day is actively breathing in and out and actively watching Netflix. I'm kidding, but I'm actually not. I think one of the best things you can do on a rest day is like lay down as much as possible and keep your feet up. Even if you have to work, when you come home from work, like lay down. Laying down is a wonderful thing. I don't know why there's such a stigma about laying down and putting your feet up. Like it is one of the greatest, thing, greatest things you can do for your body. The only thing better than laying down on a rest day is foam rolling and then laying down on a rest day. I love that feeling of just like smushing my legs and kind of feeling like the fluids and everything is rolling around in there. Drink a ton of water and just like lay, watch Netflix. Like this is me, laptop on the belly. I am like watching Netflix. I have like a huge bottle of water next to me. Like that's a rest day. That's what you should be doing. I know it's really hard. I know your brain is gonna be super activated. And by the way, we didn't get to that question this time, but we are next week gonna answer the question about what kind of goes on in your exercise addicted mind when you're experiencing withdrawal symptoms. We're gonna talk about that next week. But on a rest day, it's really important that you just do something that is not sport related. This is the time for you to take up knitting or crocheting or cross stitching or I don't know, decoupage. What do people do these days? I saw the article in the New York Times for making those paper beads. Like do that, do anything. Bake some cookies, call a friend, read a book. Gosh, do anything. I would even go so far as to say like, don't read sports blogs and websites and don't like plan your training on those days or start thinking about next year's races and stuff. Like give yourself the mental break. It can be really important. It can be really restorative. You can expand your life in ways you didn't even think were possible. One thing that I have never talked about before on this channel, but I want to make clear is that even when I was running the most and destroying myself at the very apex of my self-destruction. All the miles per week I was running, I always took one day off per week. I was not one of those seven day a week runners. I was not. I was six days a week, yes, but I always took a rest day off. I don't truly remember what I was doing during those rest days. Chances are I was working or just, you know, being an idiot in general, but I will say that the way you approach your rest days and the frequency with which you take a rest day really does absolutely 100% lead to your longevity as an athlete. Make them a very important part of your life as an athlete. The more rest days you take, the longer you'll be at this. I wish I had taken more rest days because maybe I wouldn't have had to go through all this, but then I wouldn't have met all of you. So eh, it's a balance for me. This has been a super long video, but thank you for watching. Next week, we're gonna cover, and I should have written them down, all the questions that I didn't get to. If you still wanna add some questions, please uh, leave a comment below or email me at caseofthegills at gmail.com. You can schedule a mentoring call with me at caseofthegills.com. Did I say that right? I did. Follow me on Instagram, wear your mask, Wash your hands, don't get desperate. Hope you have a great week wherever you are and I will see you again soon. Thank you so much for watching.